The top news stories at this hour, European leaders warning the European Union could face total collapse. You have France, Italy, all the other majors lined up to walk out the door as well. It's a failed experiment right. that didn't take into account the, nation, the, the, the national pride of each nation. And if Britain does vote to get out of Europe, it will be a domino effect. Other countries will follow suit. The European Union could collapse within two years. And I think ultimately, the European Union will fall apart. Brexit. Has the European Union on the brink of collapse? Literally nothing. Has the European Union on the brink of collapse? Um, people will rethink, and the European Union as we know it now will not exist in 10 years. Trust me. Trust me. Okay, hold on for a second. This clip is 10 years old. The EU still exists. Even though critics are not getting tired of preaching why, how and when it will ultimately fail, so far none of these prophecies have materialized. The euro didn't explode and neither Brexit nor migration caused its collapse. Actually, the opposite is the case. Crisis had usually enabled the biggest integration steps. Like a European Union. However, there is one thing potent enough that may cause its downfall. And this is exactly what I'm gonna share with you in this video. Trust me. Either the Europe of nation-states is going down, or the project of overcoming nation-states is going down. Either way, the EU is our downfall. This is a quote from the book The European Career from Robert Menasse, novelist and one of Europe's most ambiguous critics. His argumentation is both obvious and unsurprising, and it starts with a European story of old. Nationalism. Really? That easy? Yeah? Not quite, but let me share with you some key ideas I learned reading his book. Number 1. The historic reason is war. Let's have a quick look at European history. That's the Wikipedia page of European conflicts. Hmm. So, I think you got the point. European history is a history of war and conflict. It's a seemingly endless sequence of armed conflicts that led to nothing but death and destruction. The Thirty Years' War, the Seven Years' War, the Napoleonic Wars, the Franco-German War, just to name a few. And finally World War I, the so-called War to End All Wars, that left 50 to 22 million people dead. But that wasn't the end. Only two decades later, racism and nationalism fueled by technological revolutions led to Europeans' Armageddon and the unspeakable horrors of World War II. Long story short, Europe has basically been at war with itself for most of its history. The experience of these wars was the seed for an integrated European continent. The historic reason, therefore, is peace, and this cannot be overestimated. The most expensive peace project. And yeah, peace doesn't have a price tag. Number two, a new approach, the Schumann Plan. At this point in history, they understood peace treaties are not worth the paper that they are written on. After the peace treaty is before the war. 1950, far-sighted European politicians chose a different approach for peace. The unification of Europe. How? We are going to swallow our pride. By creating supranational institutions. The French foreign minister, Robert Schumann, proposed a radical plan to create a European community. Look, Schumann just started to speak. Oh Lord, off we go. Le Conseil de l'Europe en effet. France's foreign minister, Robert Schumann, is the author of the bold imaginative plan which bears his name. An economic community open to all of Europe. It oversees the production of coal and steel. And that has a reason. Coal and steel were not only essential for economic recovery, but also vital for the production of armory, munition and weapons. Pooling nation's sovereignty and creating a common higher authority made war between France and Germany not only unthinkable, but materially impossible. The first aim was economic, but the ultimate aim was political, no less than the unity of Europe. The 9th of May 1950 is widely considered to be the birth date of European unity. Number 3. The purely economic union. Europe has come a long way since. Over the decades, it has evolved into a union that provides a single market for its members and is an economic powerhouse. It enables goods, services, money and most importantly people to move freely across Europe. But that's not the whole story. No, it's not. It's far more. There has always been a political and an economic dimension. Economic cooperation is essential to the EU. 
but it's not that goal in itself. It's only the means to an end. The equation is simple. Countries that increasingly trade with one another are less likely to go to war with each other. Economic interdependence is a first step for political integration. Reducing the EU to a mere trade federation neglects the historic reality and can best be understood with the case of the UK. The UK always favored a mere trade federation. Due to its supranational character and political dimension, the UK did not join in the 1950s. And Great Britain was neither invaded nor occupied during World War II and never had the urgency to politically integrate with the continent. They had strong ties with the US and the Commonwealth of Nations. This is why they never fully committed to the political dimensions of the project and sadly led to their departure. It was never in their national interest. How is this the national interest? Speaking of which, what does it even mean? Number four, the fallacy of national interest. Americans have a different understanding of the notion. Especially that guy up there. You know what I am? I'm a nationalist, okay? I'm a nationalist. Usually using it synonymously with national security. It stands for an absolute justification of means for a rather abstract end. In the European context, it is a handy tool for national politicians. To make sense of it, we have to understand the power play of the three main institutions. The European Commission, appointed by the member states, the European Parliament, directly elected by the people of Europe, and finally the Council, national leaders representing each member state, the embodiment of national interest, the protector of the nation-state sovereignty. The author has difficulties with those bloated terms. I have not yet heard a convincing explanation what that specific national interest may be. Do we not all want a framework that provides the chance of a good life, peace, freedom, security and the rule of law? Are these not the values that need protection at European level that are common to all European citizens? It's a bit histrionic, don't you think? Fair enough. To me, more often than not, the national interest seems to be nothing more than the very own interest of the domestic political elites that claim to protect it in the council. Number 5. Nationalism. But what's so bad about nationalism after all? There's nothing wrong with patriotism and being proud of one's country, history or tradition. Indeed it isn't. If it creates a feeling of community and encourages people to solidarity, it sounds like a pretty good concept. This capacity for destruction cannot be underestimated. We have to understand that nationalism is nothing but a fiction. Potent one, but still. An abstract concept, powerful and with horrific potential. Or easier... Nationalism is just politics for basic bitches. To create unity, it needs an antagonist. Nationalism tends to misuse the innocent patriotism for arbitrary aims. Especially during a time of crisis, nations tend to slide into aggressive dynamics. National interest, be it their identity, national security, or whatever other concept the marketing propaganda department spits out. States that aggressively pursue these national interests against other competing states has been the cause for many wars in the last centuries. It's historically tainted and will never be innocent. And I can't believe to say that, but this is also the reality in 2022. Once again, nationalism and neo-imperialism has led to a war on European soil. European integration should therefore never be to create one European supernation with one language, one culture and one narrative. The EU is often criticized for being too slow and incapable of action. Manasse is very clear on where the problem lies. It's the council. National politicians have made it a sport to play domestic politics on EU level. It's the same story over and over again. Whenever something goes wrong, it was them in Brussels. National interest functions as a blank excuse for hindering common European action and exploited by selling to the domestic voters. Collateral damage of such short-sighted and irresponsible behavior is hardly seen. But paired with a campaign built on pride and disinformation, it can have fatal consequences. A whole country could stumble into a mess. Number 7. A compromised European idea. So what is it now that will bring the EU to its end? According to the author, an unfulfilled promise. First, the deadlock in the status quo. A single currency without a common tax or economic policy. A parliament without sufficient parliamentary powers a commission without the accountability of a real government. And secondly, 
the resurrection of the national disguised as the sovereign. A modern world is fundamentally post-national. From supply chains to financial transactions, cultural communication, the threat of nuclear war to tax evasion, digitalization to ecological collapse. European economics and politics have a common destiny. We are in the midst of a historic process, not at the end. The EU is the most ambitious peace project in the history of humanity. And it is not a self-runner. Stefan Zweig once asked the question, will Europe continue its self-destruction or will it become one in a supranational organization? This was in 1932. The rest is history. So please do not let us take the wrong path. Not again. I'm not gonna shoot myself in the foot anymore. It's better to swallow pride than blood. So what's the easy solution? Less nationalism, more multinationalism. Not quite. Continue to establish a European democracy without creating a centralized superstate that integrates people rather than nations and embraces diversity of languages and cultures. Well, that'll be easy. Yes, it's utopian. But so is the book and the spirit of European unity. Let me conclude with the favorite quote of the book freely translated. Poets think further than political pragmatists. There is countless proof that what was contemporarily considered utopian obeys a sustainable reason. While the pragmatists always went down very pragmatically with the respective world beyond which they could not think. It's a pretty roast as well. You can find the link to the books in the description if you enjoyed this content. Please consider to like and subscribe below.